are visiting with us for the first time and you uh, like I've never experienced Redemption Church, I'm not really sure what this is about. We have um, a lot of opportunities to get to know you, but one thing's in the card right outside the lobby here is a connection card. If you have prayer requests, uh, you want to be a part of our email list, which we don't spam you, just information about the church, anything like that, fill that out, give it to one of us, put in the offering plate. We'd like to just get to know you, share with you what's going on at Redemption Church. Also, you're new today to the series, we have been working through the book of John, and so we're, we're kind of walking through each chapter, and right now we're going to be in chapter 11 of John, um, the Gospel of John, and so we, uh, that's the way we preach here at Redemption Church, as we go through um, His Holy Word, and we value it more than anything, and we're so excited to be a part of this with you, and so um, it, last week, Bobby delivered a message at the beginning of John 11, when, and the whole story kind of ties together this week as well, it's about Lazarus' death and then ultimately his resurrection. And uh, so Bobby was talking a lot about one of the things that last week, and uh, he, he brought in Job chapter 13, verse 15, where he says, though you slay me, I will put my hope in you. And that's been resting and resonating with me for a while, is, is that even through suffering, his glory is still made known, right? And we've been kind of sitting through that, and we see the culmination of that this week. And so before we dive in, one of the things as a culture, we know we like the idea of infinity, the, the word infinity and living forever and not ever dying. I was with a community group this week of younger people, much younger than me, which by the way, Tim now makes me look like I'm the oldest guy on staff. He, he cleaned off his beard. Um, I am not the oldest guy. Somebody else is, but uh, because of Tim, it makes it look like it's me. But we like this idea of living forever. And so I'm talking to this group of younger people and I said, yeah, I used the reference of Highlander. Um, some of you all are certain age have no idea, but does anybody know what I'm talking about when I say Highlander? Right, now don't go watch that. I'm just telling you, it's this idea of, of this guy who lives forever, right? And we love that. It plays out in pretty much everything we do with entertainment. We like this idea of living forever, um, whether it's in comic books or movies, whatever. We, we enjoy the idea of not dying. As a matter of fact, Tim also shared with me an article that was pretty interesting. In Ohio, I believe it is, there's an ABC News article about a company that when you die, you can pay a good chunk of money to, and they will take your body, and they will freeze it. Cryogenics, right? And then when they come up with a cure for whatever it is that killed you, they will bring you back and then cure you. So for a certain amount of money, you can do that. Now, some things you cannot come back from. Um, you know, some of the things that why people die, there's, there's not going to ever be a cure for that, right? We also know that that's not going to work. Right? Cryogenics is not a thing that's going to happen. There's a lot of doctors and scientists who are like, your brain can't even do that. Um, it, it will die pretty much immediately. Um, but we will put in money, like the, these people are going to pay $50,000, if not more, to have their body frozen after they're dead. And they have no idea if it'll ever play out back again, right? And, and they're, they're hoping on this idea of living forever. Because if you can keep doing that, right, just reset. Um, a lot of sci fi movies kind of play that game, right? When we can just do it all over again. Come, come back after I've been dead, cure me, let me go back. We love this idea because, quite frankly, none of us are really excited about the idea of death. I can't think anybody's like, hey, man, that's, that's right up my alley. I'm hoping and wishing and praying. That's, this is not something we desire. We love ourselves, right? That's the root nature of sin in us is our own selfishness. We love us. We want us to, to be glorified, to feel good. We like, we like ourselves. And so... Um, we struggle with this idea of death, and especially when we love those around us. As, and we see in John chapter 11, before we start in this, Mary and Martha lose their brother. And they, this guy is loved by everyone around him. He's esteemed, and it is breaking their hearts. But they also love Jesus, and they also know that Jesus has the ability to do things that no one else can. And so they're wrestling with this tension and it leads us into where we are with John chapter 11. We're going to start in verse 25. We're overlapping a little bit from last week. In verse 25, Jesus is talking to Martha because she came up to him and she's like, you know, I know you could have done this. You could have saved him, right? And he says to her in verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who's coming into the world. We're going to pause there. Tomorrow, we're starting off with this idea, and no, it's not even an idea, the proclamation of truth that Jesus is the resurrection. And this is something he's reiterating to her. He's trying to make them understand that I am the resurrection. So we start off this, he's having this conversation, 
And what Jesus is doing here, as she's answering, he's trying to divert her attention away from the, the belief of just the last day, because she knows that in the end, he's, he's taught her. He, he, she knows that he's going to you know, bring the dead to life. She knows that. But he's like, no, I'm not trying to lead you there. I want you to understand about the personal belief in who I am. And I'm the resurrection now, currently in front of you, today. It's not about tomorrow, it's today. And he's trying to wrestle this tension with her, as we're going to see. And so he is the resurrection. The resurrection and life show us both what life is like in Christ, but also that we must believe in Christ. And there, there are two different things, being given life, but also believing in that life that you're given. And, and he even talks about this in the early part of this chapter, right? Of, of like, yes, you've been given life in Christ, but also, do you believe and know and understand who he is that has given you this life? And so most of you be like, well, of course, you can't have one without the other. But I believe we, a lot of us are trying to have one without the other. We must start with the belief that Jesus is the resurrection. He is the giver of life. And he, we're starting off with this idea. Many, um, I love this quote I found. Uh, Many of us bear witness today to the personal life-changing power of the living Christ. When you put your faith in him, he came by his spirit into your life. He began to show his power and love in your experience. There began a new love for God, a new love for people, a new hope and joy, a new patience in trouble, a new freedom from the old enslavements, and courage to stand for justice and righteousness. The changes that, has made, that he has made in us are evidence that he is alive and real. Christ is with them firsthand. He's walking through this with these um, loved ones of his. He's walking through this journey. They've watched him heal a man from blindness from birth, give him sight. They've watched him do these things. They know he has this power, and they're walking through them, and he's trying to say to them, hey, the resurrection is in and through me. Jesus is the resurrection. And we, we kind of get caught up in everything else of, of this whole journey. One of the things I think we struggle with oftentimes is we treat Jesus as a means to an end. Yes, he is the deliverer of our sin. Yes, ultimately, when we put our faith in him and receive salvation from him, we are saved eternally. But he's with us now. We don't have to wait till tomorrow, till the end, to embrace this relationship with Christ. He's a personal savior with us today. He is the resurrection now. And the, the thing we miss in that, though, is we go about our lives wondering why we don't understand, even like the early part of this chapter, why does suffering hurt so bad? Well, there's the, always the earthly part of it. It's not going to stop and go away. We're always going to hurt. Pain from losing loved ones, pain from relationships, pain from job loss, whatever the circumstances is, it's always going to be painful. But the perspective changes when we recognize who Christ is now. That doesn't make it easy. doesn't mean that it will go smoothly. But it does change an eternal perspective. One of the things, and I, I've shared this before, when people say, you know, I'm so, I'm so worried about my kids being raised in this world today. I am not worried because I know the Savior who has given me salvation will also work in their lives. And I know that even though the world itself is going to get dark, he hasn't changed. The, the Savior that I'm hoping that they point, I'm pointing them to is going to be the same one that they're going to encounter. And he's not changed the resurrection is in Jesus. And so Jesus is walking through with his loved ones. And this is funny. This chapter brings out a lot of emotions. Bobby shared pretty eloquently last week about Jesus emptying himself and allowing his father to be his father. And he was a human here on earth so that we could understand and know and follow his example, giving that opportunity to let the Father lead in that way. And so Jesus is walking through with us, showing us, and he's emotionally all over the place in this because he loves these people. And we're going to kind of see how this plays out. So this next thing we need to understand that Jesus, after Jesus is the resurrection is the need of resurrection. Verse 28. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the uh, village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. 
And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? So we're looking at the need for the resurrection and also Christ's understanding of the depravity of man, our sinful brokenness, the part in us that has separated us from the beginning from our creator. We remember the story from his word, right? He created us in his perfect image and then our sin separated us from our perfect creator. And this journey from the beginning of the, uh, the Word of God till now is watching him weave through this timeline, the Redeemer, that's going to restore us in the right relationship, which is Jesus Christ. And that when our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and we receive salvation through him, then we have restored this relationship again. That righteousness is not from our own doing, but Christ's righteousness is making us right. right? We see that happening through this. And so um, he's really understanding the depravity of man in this. right? We see that all the time around us. Brokenness. Um, we, we go through seasons where even whether it's the news or, or out in public in the community, um, grocery shopping, right? The poverty man comes alive and well when you go grocery shopping. Um, I don't understand, so we got rules for traffic on the road. We should also have rules for traffic in a grocery store. Like if there's a main thing that gets the right of way, if you're coming out, you wait for whoever's walking on the main path. I'm going to hit you because I'm on the main path. I will apologize afterwards, but I'm going. You don't just get to walk out in front of that. Like, that's just, it's like a car, right? You can't just come out when you choose. You wait until traffic is clear. We see the depravity man in everything, right? The brokenness, raising our children, right? Not only just in them, in us. I see my points of frustration in my own heart trying, because everyone wants, like, I always picture, um, my family growing up being kind of like, you know, we were supposed to be like Leave it to Beaver, right? Ward Cleaver, um, where my kid would come home and be like, hey, Dad, it was swell today at school, and I'm going to go do my chores and homework. I'm like, good job, son and daughter, because and, it could have been any of them, right? And, and then my wife and I would both, because it's 2019, we'd cook together. Um, things have changed. And um, it would just be great and everyone, but that's not life, right? We are all broken people. There's a lot of yelling and throwing and things. We don't throw things, you might. But there's a lot of these things happening in tension. We get it around us. Why? Because we like ourselves so much, we can't stand the idea of being disrespected. I struggle with that more than anything. I cannot handle the idea of you disrespecting me, although that's exactly what plays out. And the silly thing about it is it has nothing to do with me, and it shouldn't. But man, oh, you disrespect me. And so what I, what I was sharing before is I like to try to use different implementation of my force, my power, like my Hulk Hogan voice. Get over here! You know, like, and it works never. Not one time do my kids fear me when I try to, like, up the ante and get louder and get more aggressive and get, if anything, they start making fun of me more. And we're at that age where that's where that happens. We, we, we see this around us, right? So Jesus is coming up with Mary and Martha. Martha wants to pull Mary out privately. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One of the things we know, though, Jesus going back into Jerusalem, they wanted to kill him. Even his disciples were struggling with that. No, you don't go back there. They're going to kill you. But also, too, I think a lot of it is in the home, all the Jews and Mary are grieving and it's loud. I think it's also part of it is he wanted a little privacy from that, a little break from that chaos, like, hey, come on out here and meet me. So he's outside the village. He's not even in. She comes out to meet him. Now, what happens is the Jews see that she's going and they assume, hey, she must be going to weep, so they follow her. So that privacy thing doesn't happen. Like, everyone's coming along to this journey because to, to, they're, they're consoling. They're good friends. They want to be there alongside of her. Her brother has died. They're walking through this journey with her. Mary comes to Jesus, and her conversation is very similar to her sister's. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She knows he has the power to do amazing things. She believes that he is who he has said he is. And her expectation is for him to do those very things, right? She's watched all of this thing happen. And one time, and probably in her mind, like, he's your friend. He deserves this more than the blind guy did. And I'm, I, she may not think that, but I know that's how I think sometimes, right? 
I like to rate things that are deserved more than others. Like, that's not fair that they got the blessing when this person over here deserved it more. When we don't deserve any of it, right? That's the beauty of the Gospels. We all come to the same page. And I'm not saying Mary was doing that, but she's saying to him, hey, if you would have been here, he would not have died. And she knows that. She knows his power. She knows his strength. And Christ is looking at this, and this is the most interesting thing, right? So she says that when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with him also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. First, there's an understanding, uh, I think, of what's going on here. The first word, deeply moved, is used again in verse 38 and also three other times outside of his gospel. It is never a word of compassion, but a word of rebuke or warning. Also, the other word, greatly troubled, signifies being shaken or agitated. It's the same word for the waters in the pool of Bethesda being stirred up. And it's also the word Jesus will use later on in John 14, 1, where he says, let your hearts not be troubled. It's not positive emotion. Jesus was shaken, he was upset, and he was disturbed. The question is, why? Why is he upset over this? Now, there, you could always suggest that it is the loss of this friend. I think there's a couple reasons for it. One, I think Jesus was upset and disturbed that they were continually trying to push his hand on miracles. They wanted him to act in a way that he wasn't willing to act. Now, one of the things we know, the people were waiting for this Redeemer to come in, and what did they want? They wanted him to come in like a lion, they wanted him to be this guy that's going to take over Roman rule, just like David did. They want him to conquer. They want him to flex his muscles and be just the mighty warrior that they've been waiting for. That's their desire, and that's not how he's acting. He is coming in humbly, and his motive is entirely different because he doesn't need to overcome thrones because he already has. He doesn't need that. So Jesus is not acting in their way, and he's agitated. Also, the brokenness of the humanity of the world, that the sin leads to death. All these things are, are ad, working in his heart, and he's emotional for sure. Does he love Lazarus? Absolutely. There's not a part of us that questions that. But in this moment, Jesus is like, you all need to stop. Like we see at the end of that, right? Could they, the Jews are saying, could not he open the eyes of the blind man also who have kept this man from dying? Could he not have done that? Of course he could have done that, but that wasn't the plan. That wasn't what his father had willed, which, remember, he's doing the will of his father. He was continually being questioned, further revealing just the lostness of the world around him. And that's kind of what we still want and anticipate. We follow Christ only when we feel like it seems like it's meaningful, like there's this big movement of conquering and overcoming things. Then we're all on board. But when it's quiet and still and difficult, we kind of lose interest super quick. It's like watching a Netflix show, you, you lock in for two seasons and it's great, and then if something happens, you just forget and lose interest and you, you stop watching it, right? Maybe that's just me. I, I'm, I'm a very simple person. I lose interest pretty fast on a lot of things, right? And we kind of treat our faith in Christ like that. We get bored because we're not seeing him come in like a, a warrior. I love that kind of idea of being a warrior, but when it doesn't happen that way, does that mean my God is not just as equally mighty and is equally doing the work? No, he's just not doing it the way that I see and want him to. That's the brokenness in us, the brokenness in humanity. We, we kind of forget that our needs are not what we think they are. I, I, I will always, I haven't watched it because I don't have the time to do it ever again, but the, I love the movie Braveheart. Right, This idea of, of a warrior standing up for his people, loving them enough to conquer and, and, and take you know, control of destiny. But that's not the way God works and asks us to, right? He doesn't want or need us to um, be that. That's his job. We don't have to work in such a way. Now, there are moments in life where he calls us to battle for sure. We've seen that even in the Old Testament and even now. Those, but that's not what we're talking about here. We have this idea, this pretty idea that Jesus is just going to be the boss, and that's how we want him to look. But he's coming in in a different way because the need for resurrection is so much different than we understand it to be. They still couldn't trust the works of God through Christ. They couldn't put their faith and trust in him. And as a church, we struggle a lot because we, when it doesn't play out the way we think it should, we dismiss it. Or we forget that belief in Christ is something more than just what we physically and tangibly see. Because I love tangible experiences of God's hand in my life. Man, those are my favorite, right? When I see him, 
uh, do something we saw. Uh, when we see people come to Christ, we've been praying for it. When we see him heal people that we've been waiting for him to heal. When we see him deliver people out of situations that were difficult. Man, those are my favorite things to see and experience. But the problem is that is not always how it's working because I don't get to be a part of that always. God's hand in our life doesn't necessarily show itself tangibly in front of us. Does that mean we don't pursue him with everything in us? No, because he is still the resurrection, the life giver, the one who brings those who are dead to life. It's still in him. And so we like to think logically and linearly sometimes. Logically, um, if this equation means this, 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 and this, and surely that's going to happen again. So like, for instance, if Jesus can heal a blind man, and then surely the, his job and task on this planet needs to be always to do and heal the broken that way. And so we, we saw it one way. We're going to always want and expect to see it again. Right? We have this idea that we want to repeat. It needs to happen the same way again. Okay, God, do the same thing you just did. He doesn't have to do a single thing. He's already conquered death. He's already defeated sin. He doesn't need to do this. And we, we kind of put that in there. And so we see the need for the resurrection because these people are questioning him. We do it all the time. Does it make us bad that we don't have the power and strength to always understand? No, because that's the frailty of us as humans. However, what we do know that his promise is he is the sustainer of life. He is the giver of life. We know that in his word. We see it to be true. That's partly why, too, I don't believe you can walk faithfully in Christ apart from the body of Christ. I don't believe you can do it. Because I think in so, you don't have anyone else walking through with you, pointing you back to the areas where you go astray. Because I can guarantee you, you will go astray. Not because you're not awesome, but because you are broken just like I am. We all are. We are going to, man, the mental games in my head that I have to play sometimes. That's why I have so many people in my life to speak into it. Like, no, 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 no. You can't go there. No, no, sorry, man. No, that's not a good idea. Because I'm going to go in my flesh anywhere I want to. Uh, oh, everyone hates me. I'm the worst ever. That's... It's not the truth, right? Or I'm the worst father ever. That might be true. I don't know. Um, my wife and I joke all the time that we, have, well, we just lost the Parent of the Year Award, um, which I don't know if they ever give that out, but we've never been in the running for it. Um, one day there, Jen. One day. We'll get there. Um, probably not. But um, So the need for resurrection, sorry. Um, we see it, Jesus makes it clear the most troubling piece of this is the unbelief that it rests on not who Jesus is, but on the display of power. Y'all, we can't just walk in hoping for the power. We've got to see him as our redeemer, our, our, the giver of life, the person that we love more than anything. And we need to walk alongside in that relationship to understand who he is. Because he was with Mary and Martha then. He wasn't worried about the later part. He was there at the time. And we like to skip to the end. Y'all ever read a book and go just straight to the last chapter? I don't, well, no, I don't because, um, well, it's like a movie, right? You don't go to the end credits to, to see what happens. Well, the credits wouldn't give you anything, but like, no, you, you got to walk through it, right? We always want to skip to the end because then we can get the full picture and that's just not how that's going to play itself out. The, we must rest in our belief of who Jesus is and the resurrection is crucial because of our brokenness. We need life. And the most dangerous move as a church, I said this a moment ago, is, is us believing that Christ is a means to an end. He is not. He is now. He is the end. But he's also current. And he was also before. And he will go bef uh, uh, all around us, whatever direction we want to go in. That's where Jesus is. And we need to walk through that with that understanding, that hope, and that rest, and that assurance. And that's where that perspective comes from, because we don't live in a one-dimensional, we don't live with a one-dimensional God. He is everywhere. He's in all places. And when we use his perspective on how we should understand uh, life, and suffering, and joy, and pain, and sorrow, and happiness, when all of those are, are channeled through that lens, then truly we get to see a glimpse of who he is. Obviously, we can't see it all yet. Because we aren't him. But he gives us a picture of that. Which leads us to the glory through the resurrection. Everything we do here, hopefully and prayerfully, is for his glory. The women's conference this weekend, hopefully and prayerfully, was used for his glory. When we go out into the community, when we do 
block parties, when we're talking to people at the grocery stores, when we are having lunch with our friends, when we're doing Bible studies, whatever it is, hopefully everything we do is to point people to him for his glory. Verse 38, then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took the stone, away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth, and Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. So we see first Christ coming to the place where Lazarus was laid, and most of the time back in this time period, um, they were buried in natural caves. Um, and a lot of times, depending on whether it's vertical or horizontal, wherever they put the body in, the stone was placed in front of it to kind of seal it off and keep it in there. It makes sense. But like, you know, so they're all over the place. There's not like now where we have a mortuary and it's all in one spot. So Jesus goes to the place where Lazarus was, and he's like, hey, take away the stone. And now, here's the funny thing about this, right? So Martha comes in, and she takes charge. She's like, no, 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 no. You're not going to move the stone. First of all, do you know what kind of smell is going to come from that? Like, she, she's typical. Like, there's always one in every group, right, who's the boss. Um, you can decide who's the one in your group. I don't know who that is. Um, but who's in charge? And they're like, that just doesn't make logical sense. You move that, it's going to reek. We're all going to smell it for days. It's just a bad idea. No, because, again, she's forgotten about what he had talked about. She's not paying attention to this, Right? She makes it clear as she's objecting to his request, and it confirms her earlier conversation that she didn't realize that Jesus was going to raise her brother immediately. She is not paying attention to him. She's not picturing this because, she, again, she does know that in the end it's all going to work for his glory. She's heard him teach that, and he's like, no, you're not getting this. I'm about to do this thing now. And so Martha is, is kind of pushing back, and he opens the, the stone away from the tomb and then he says did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God so they took the stone away and he lifted up his eyes and this is my favorite part here he says father I thank you that you have heard me so he prays to his Lord and we see in this prayer some very significant things first his direct reference to God as the father he wants them to know who his father is he wants the, everyone around him to hear him talk to his father, to recognize the creator of the universe the way they should. He's, he's introducing this conversation. But then also, he's already, this indicates that he's already asked for Lazarus' life from his dad. Because the only next part is to thank him for it. Right? So he's already had that conversation. Father, please bring him back to life. Please bring him from dead to life. And in so, thank you so much for hearing me. And he's doing this out loud, and everyone's hearing him say this. He's like, Father, thank you for doing this. And the public nature of the prayer, and he says this, right, is to draw his hearers into the intimacy of Jesus his, in his own relationship with the Father. He wants to show them what that looks like. He's trying to make them aware that it's not about just the end, it's the now. And there's this connection here to the Father. We all have this connection with the Creator. We all have the opportunity when we receive Christ and we receive salvation through him, that we have this connection with the creator of the universe, and he's showing them what this looks like. And it reveals that Jesus does nothing by himself, but is totally dependent and um, on and obedient to the Father's will. The Father has orchestrated this entire thing, and he's following through with the Father's will, showing people uh, the glory of the resurrection, showing them what happens. And we see after this, right, that he commands Lazarus to come out. And Lazarus raises up from the dead. He walks on out. They take the cloths off. And that's not even the most amazing part of the story. That's not the part we should be hanging on. It's what Jesus is communicating to all of us, even then, that it is power through him, through his Father. That's what we have to rest in. So we look at this. We look at the chapter as a whole. We see that all suffering leads for his glory. We see the joys and the sorrows are for the purpose of his glory. We see that all the resurrection of life comes through Jesus that means the perspective that we have to have in life is this. 
that whether it is a season of joy, a season of pain, a season of, of just excitement or sorrow, whatever it is, it's all for his glory and for his purpose. We, we know this for sure, right? Minus the couple guys in the Old Testament that didn't die, death is 100% right now, right? We all are going to do it. It's, the, the percentages are pretty stacked against us. We're not going to make it out. You gone. We know that, right? And so while we're here on this earth, what does that mean for us? Well, we have a couple of choices. Choice number one is we make ourselves feel really good now. And we live life the best we can so we can enjoy this for ourselves at the moment because then one day it's going to end and we know that, right? It is a choice. Choice number two is we do that with a different perspective, right? We, we do our best to enjoy life now, but with the purpose of honoring and glorifying God in everything we do, with the hope of resurrection in our life, knowing that if we receive salvation through him, it is not done for us. Those of us that have received salvation in Christ Jesus do have a tomorrow, even if today's not promised. And everything we do then shapes through that worldview, that lens, as we discipline our children, as we engage in our, our workplace with, with bosses that maybe we don't agree with as we're doing difficult things. Everything comes through the lens then of if I am redeemed and given life through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then everything I need to do needs to glorify him. Does that mean you can't enjoy life? No, do it. But do it to honor and give him glory. Allow him to be a part of the worldview that you're shaped with now. And, and when things happen that break you, it's okay. You're human. You are allowed to be broken. We're not asking anyone to stop feeling the way you feel. We're not saying you're not supposed to have sorrow. And you're not, those are emotions that exist for all of us and always will. Because until that happens, we're not going to get away from pain. But it doesn't have to be permanent. It doesn't have to be the place we stay because the hope of the resurrection is in front of us. And while there is a tomorrow, we do see that he is walking with us today. And it is a now that we have to embrace. What does that mean for us as believers? That means we will continue to walk through recognizing the work that he has done in our lives through his word, through the people he's given us. Well, that means we communicate with our Savior that we have this relationship with him, that we actually believe that it is a relationship and not just this foo-foo thing in the sky that we kind of all talk about. My favorite thing is when my kids catch me talking to myself, whether in prayer or anything else, right? They, they find it really weird, which they should. It is weird. But sometimes I just have to audibly hear myself talk to him because I don't know how else to hear it. Um, when we were in Charleston, we lived in a very sketchy neighborhood, that um, I may or may not have had neighbors get put in jail in front of us a couple times, okay? So I'd go prayer walking. I want to go for a walk and praying, but they all thought it was really weird, so I would take my phone and put it up to my ear so it looked like I was talking to someone as I was walking because I didn't want to get shot. Um, and believe it or not, after we moved out, someone did get shot, so I, the Lord was using that. Um, but, you know, I want to have this relationship and this connection with my Savior who is walking through this with me today. And while my hope is still for tomorrow, the journey is now. And it can be for you. And some of you already is now. And our hope and prayer is that for everything we do, that we point everyone to him so that they can see and know what it means to know Jesus and what he has done for us through the resurrection that when he brought us to life on the cross, because before Jesus, we were dead in our trespasses, our sin was overwhelming. Before him, we couldn't pay the price for what we have done to our creator. The, the cost of that price was death. But Jesus came to earth, gave of himself, and paid that price for us. So that when we receive salvation in him and believe that he is that savior, we no longer have to pay that debt. We no longer have to pay that debt. And that is the, the truth that we are proclaiming. We as a church can do nothing for you. But we will point you to him who can do everything. I don't have power. I'm just a dude. But I serve the one who does. And that's our goal is to point everyone to him. And our desire is to see everyone rest in the resurrection of Jesus.